so this is where um this is where probably you and i disagree and again we can disagree and still be friends <laughs> i think you're a great guy and you're providing a lot of value to your audience so all of that is noted um when i have money i actually do not separate it into okay this is savings this is investing um i have my small emergency fund that i need if something happens but then every dollar that i have is an investment and and it could be a good investment or it could be a bad investment so like um for example I just took my whole family to Hawaii. I took my mom, my sister, my wife, um, my sister's family, like all that stuff, right? So that that is money that I'm parting with. Um, and that's how I look at things. I, I don't look at it like, oh, this is, this is for saving and this is for investing and this is for leisure. I say, here's my pool of money and here's what I'm parting with. So when I, sorry, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, no, you're good. Oh, okay. So when I talk about how I don't believe whole life for me particularly is a good financial product is because I look at, well, what else could I use that money for? So um, I'll share my screen real quick. Um, let's see if I can do window. Mm -hmm. I'll give you access. Um, okay. Okay. Here's the one. Okay. Share. Let me know if you see what I see. I'll go back to this yep. thing. Okay. So after the couple of years of funding your your policy up front, you said you put in 496,000, is that right? Uh, 490K principal. Yep, 490,000 um, is the principal. Okay, did I do that right? Um, yep. Yes. Um, An annual addition, you're not gonna put anything else in because it's funded, awesome. Yeah, so um, we're, we're assuming we're in year eight. Got it, okay, so um, got it. So then we're, what we're gonna do is, um, if you just let this ride for, because you're 25 now, right? Yeah. Okay, you're 25. We're going to say a 10% annual return just because that's what the S&P 500 has averaged since inception. By the time you're 25, or sorry, by the time you're 65, if you take that same principle of 490,000, you put it in the S&P 500, you don't contribute anything else, you let it ride at the interest rate that is done historically since inception, by the time you reach the normal retirement age, You'll have over $22 million in that account when you're 65 and you don't have to die to get it. And I understand people are going to say, oh, well, what if stocks go up? What if stocks go down? It's not a guarantee. You're right. It's an investment. It's not a guarantee. But what it is, is it's historical averages. Um, and if I just Google, like, I'll just try to Google here. What What is the S&P 500 at its inception? Let's see. It says around 10% since inception in like, you know, the twenties or whatever. So of course, historical returns are no predictor of, you know, future re returns. And I, I understand that. But when I look at that and I say, man, I can make, I, I can invest this and grow it to $22 million instead of having, you know, 4 million bucks when I die. Um, plus two, by the way, um, I don't know where you have your um, stocks, but mine are all with Vanguard. And as I mentioned, I have a seven figure stock portfolio in Vanguard. I can take margin loans from Vanguard at 2%. I know you mentioned five to 6% from the insurance policy and, and those numbers will go down in 22, as you mentioned before. But I mean, at, at 2%, I can borrow anything that I want at 2% and then go invest this again, or, you know, put it into real estate or whatever. So it's not, and I think this might be where we fundamentally are different is like, I'm not saying, oh, well, this 490,000, it would be in a bank account earning zero. So it's better to have it in a whole life insurance policy. In my mind, this 490,000, it's just like, how can I deploy that the best way that I can? And for me, the answer is stocks, real estate, or my business. It's It certainly wouldn't be a, a whole life policy. It just, it just wouldn't be, in my opinion. I'll stop sharing my screen so we can come back to whatever you have to present. Perfect. This is really good stuff, by the way. Uh, this this really helps me have um, better conversations with uh, prospects, existing clients that are contemplating their fundamentals of finance. And now I'm starting to really understand how we differ. So it's not that you don't like whole life or think it's a bad product, like you've been saying multiple times. You're simply fundamentally, you don't save, period right? Whatever you do have is emergency. It's liquid. It's there like a God forbid type of a, of a thing, but you're fundamentally putting a lot of your money 
your time, money, talent, treasure into investments that you know, like real estate and stocks and things like that. And that's why you do so well. And then you're looking at the overall projection of oh, this thing's going to grow to, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars and, and upwards of, you know, we're talking a lot of money without a doubt. How do you deal with the estate planning portion of things? Like, are you going to get to that age, say 65 um, or 55 when your term expires? What what assets wrap the assets that's building that all that wealth that you're creating? Like in, in your mind, because the way I look at just to build wealth is to increase my income first, purchase or acquire cash flowing assets that produce cash flow and then wrap the assets to, to protect it. And to me, that's any type of insurance, cyber security insurance, identity insurance, legal protection insurance, lawyers, doctors, CPAs, and then whole life. So when you get to that age, 65, when I have 20 plus million just in stocks alone, what do I do then? Like, what is the strategy after 65? Once you've accumulated so much, amassed so much wealth, how, how do I get out of taxes, the tax man, Uncle Sam, and then estate taxes when I die, when they take roughly 40%, if not higher? How do we deal with that? Well, it, it depends on a few things. It depends on how much money you have. Um, you can put your money in trust. I mean, that's what I have. I married a CPA. I didn't marry her because she's a CPA, <laughs> but my wife is an accountant and she does all of our estate planning. You can give right now, um, Is it? and you might know this better than I do, but let's say you're married, right? Huh. Spouse number one can give, I think, is it 11 million, uh, like 11.2 million tax free to their um, kids. And then the spouse number two can do the same. So it's like 25 million you can give tax free. Um, over anything above that. Or I'm sorry. Over a period of time. Or is that like. No. So like, so like, let's say, let's say me, me and my wife, when we go to die or right, whatever, let's, let's say that. Let's say we both die when we're 80. Okay. And let's say that we have 25 million bucks. Um, I believe, and I could be wrong. We can look this up. We can fact check it. Yeah. I believe that you're allowed to give um, 11 million or so tax free to your um, your heirs. Basically, they can inherit that without paying any taxes. 11 Through the million trust. Per spouse. Through the um, trust. That's just, well, not even necessarily a trust. That's just like, as far as like your inheritance goes, the mm. first 11 million, I believe, per spouse is tax free. And then anything above that, there's that the Republicans would call it the death tax. Um, re Democrats call it the estate tax. Um, but yeah, so you can have your money in trust um, as we do. Again, I have a term life insurance policy. I have other insurance policies, too, but they're, you know, they're not whole life. They're like term like I, you know, I have an insurance policy for my wife's wedding ring and stuff like that. So I'm not I'm not anti insurance. Again, I'm an insurance agent. Yeah. I'm just saying what I do is I, I try to look at everything holistically and I say, well, where can I put my money so it's going to grow the best? And then let's say I amass 20 million, like, for example, and this may be me, this may be I may be weird or whatever. But let's go back to the number when we're 65. You have 4.2 million versus 22 million, okay? Mm -hmm. You can leave that $4.2 million to your family tax-free. Let's just say for sake of argument, I'm completely wrong about the, the death tax and that all of that 22 million will be taxed at 40%. Well, if I'm wrong, then I at least get to leave my kids $10 million, right? Or, or, or $12 million because mm -hmm. so much was gone to taxes as opposed to the 4 million from the life insurance policy. But um, maybe you can fact check me on this. Um, I, I believe that, and it, I, I believe that, that each spouse can leave $11 million to their kids. Maybe that's total, but um, you, feel free to, to, to look that up and see if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. And just, you know, for the audience listening, um, if there's, cause I know I have viewers that are CPAs that also sell life insurance that are, in your world, real estate investors, definitely drop some comments, some articles mm -hmm. or some, you know, somewhere in the US code, the tax code that can, you know, help us uh, make sure we're saying the right stuff. Um, but that's interesting. I like that. And I, again, I would, I would agree on that point if my fundamental of finance was I don't save uh, whatsoever. And I just, I, de I continue to deploy and deploy and deploy uh, money into these investments and things like that. So I guess the the most 
ethical thing as a financial coach, financial consultant and content creator, when I'm talking to my audience, when I'm actually on a paid consultation, I actually have a client with me. If they're like you, a Todd, they're like, hey, my personality or my financial profile, because I know there's different financial profiles. You've got people who are misers. You've got people who are, you know, uh, gamblers. There's people who are high risk, high reward. And then there's like turtles, people that, you know, only go into safe tier one, you know, type assets. So I guess when I'm talking to people, because this really helps me a lot where I'm dealing with people. If I'm dealing with, say, a version of you Todd that you're like dude saving stupid inflation's at all times high we're in hyperinflation uh you're not earn, you're not earning anything in these in these whether it's the savings financial products the the whole life um regardless of the tax free component and the compounding effect your opportunity cost is insane to to even catch up with what I'm doing in real estate and stocks then the proper thing for me to do would be to say okay you need to talk to like a Todd you need to talk to like a Robert Kiyosaki, even a Grant Cardone um, type of person that is going to really align with you on that on that frequency, because you can sleep at night knowing that you don't need to have a hundred thousand in your savings account. Like I literally have clients there. They have 50, 100, 150,000, 200,000 in savings accounts in in a CD, in a money market account. I'm like, Oh my God, they don't just, they don't realize that they just lost 40% of their purchasing power in the last 12 months. They don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. such a hard conversation for me to tell them that. And then to say, you need to invest and you need to do this and you get your money out there and get it rolling, rocking and rolling. And they're like, no, my wife said we need to have this. And now I'm like, okay, happy yeah. wife, happy life. Got it. Totally get it. <laughs> but if I'm dealing with someone like yourself, that's willing to take those measures, then I'm going to say, um, before you look at this whole life, infinite banking thing, um, I want you to take a look at Todd's channel and kind of see what he's doing and see where his, uh, fundamentals are in regards to compound interest and growth in, in investments and things like that before you allocate it. Was that like a safe, you know, kind of uh, ethical way to yeah. approach this? Cause man, do I deal with all kinds of people? I'm dealing with heavy faith people in different right. religions. I'm dealing with atheists, non-believers, and then people in between. So I'm always trying to, yeah, I think, you know, the, the whole point is that personal finance, there is no one size fits all. Right. Um, and I'm certainly not anti savings. I do have a nest egg. Like, of course you have to have something for emergencies. Right. But I, especially that I'm young, I'm a little bit older than you, but I'm, I'm like, this is the time to take risk. And you know, I, the, the That's stuff right. that I'm doing right now it wouldn't be the same advice I give to an 80 year old. <laughs> I'm not going to tell an 80 year old to go leverage and buy an apartment building, right? I'll probably tell them to be a lot more conservative. Um, but I, I will tell you, I will tell you this. Um, and if this tells you anything, that's fine. Um, I was so blessed to be able to become a multimillionaire in my twenties. And a, and a part of the reason why I did that is because, you know, um, instead of which, which looked like a really good plan that you have, but instead of putting 70,000 per year, you know, for a couple of years into a whole life plan, I took that 70,000 per year and I was leveraging real estate and I was buying stocks. Th I mean, this year from my real estate business, I'll make around $2 million, um, in, in income. Right. Um, and then I'm going to take that and invest in other things too. But, um, it's like the down payment to my third house was $65,000. And I was able to buy, you know, a six hundred and thirty thousand dollar house. By the way, that property is a uh, eight bedrooms and four bathrooms that I rent out by the bedroom, and it produces four grand a month in cash flow, right? My, I think the down payment to my fifth house was around seventy thousand. Um, mm. And same thing because what I, my strategy is usually I wait until I can buy another primary residence so I can get like ten percent down. I move into that house, I buy it, rent it out, and and move on. So. Um, my strategy has been incredibly aggressive um, for growth. And it seems that um, perhaps our upbringings made us different this way because um, we had similar upbringings, but your thing was about safety. I want safety and security and I really want to have that protection. Mine was I want to make millions and millions of dollars. Mm. And obviously I have measures in, in place to protect the wealth that I've built. 
Um, but and and that's why I have this like I don't think of it as like one bucket for savings, one bucket for this, one bucket for that. I like here's all my money. What's the best thing that I can do with this money at the time? And as you grow and as you age, that answer might change. Um, we have a baby on the way, right? That's awesome. At, at some point we're, we're going to be putting money away for college and you know all these other things sorry i hit my microphone um <laughs> but you know what i mean it, it changes as you grow and there's no one size fits all so i'm not anti insurance i'm not anti whole insurance right um i'm not anti any of that i'm saying for me personally and for other folks that i know whose goal was to basically become multi-millionaires young it, it wasn't going to make it happen. Is that fair? Like it, I, I probably wouldn't be a multimillionaire today if instead of buying real estate and stocks, I was instead buying life insurance products. And who knows, maybe I would be, but I, I don't think I would have the net worth or income that I have today if my strategy had been different. Yeah, and I think I am you um, contemplating, right? Because you you got four years on me and I've started on my personal financial journey at the age of like 18, 19, jumping in and out of multi-level marketing companies, network marketing companies, direct sales. And then after two and a half years working in food and beverage, finally, you know, said, you know, personal finance is where I want to dwell. And the way I've been making my money for the first two years of starting my YouTube channel was doing consultations, helping people pretty much get out of debt or pay off any bad consumer debts until we're left with like the mortgage and maybe student loans where the rates are tremendously low. And then I'll try to shift the conversation. Like how do we turn that liability, that house into an asset that can produce cash flow um, versus just taking the next seven years to wipe out that mortgage, which we can do that. Cause I, you know, again, constantly dealing with people with double my age where they're like, Denzel, I don't care what Todd says, I can make 20 million, 40, 60, 80 million, multi-millionaire. Dude, I just want a paid off house. I want to live happy with my wife. I want to make sure my kids have security. They don't have to worry about uh, the cost to bury me. I want to make sure I'm completely debt free and I'm cash flow positive. And that could mean making a hundred grand a year. Um, and so it's so hard to have that conversation with, with kind of getting them to think bigger. Like why not a million? Why not 10 million? Like, why does a number limit your ability and your potential to be great? You know, there's only going to be one of you on planet Earth that will ever exist. There's never been a copy of you. There never will be. You're so unique out of the seven plus billion people on planet Earth. Why would you waste that opportunity? Right.